woke up in the middle of the night and found at the end of your bed a small figure with two holes for eyes, a hole for mouth, and wearing a very strange metallic garment. Well, you'd probably scream, wake up and realize that you've been having a nightmare. Not my next guest. He didn't scream. He went along with the whole thing and he ended up in a spaceship being probed and prodded in all sorts of places. <laughs> Seriously, when he woke up in his own bed the following morning, he had a pain in his bottom, among other things, and a lot on his mind. What did he do? He wrote a book about the whole thing called Communion, and that was a huge success. And probably people in our audience have actually read that book and uh, probably been very interested by it. But his latest book is called Majestic. I have it here, and it's something else because it's unashamedly a work of fiction, but it's based on some worrying and hitherto unexplained facts which suggest that we were indeed visited by extraterrestrial beings. Will you welcome, please, Whitley Stryber. Okay, the fact, first of all, that... No. You wanted to say something. With an introduction like that, I wasn't sure that I dared to come out. <laughs> but here I am anyway. Here you are. We could talk about the personal anatomical details of what happened a long time ago. Do we have to? <laughs> we, we mentioned it in passing. But what about Majestic? It's based on a fact. Well, apparently so. Um, after these bizarre events took place and I became convinced that, that I, there was nothing wrong with me physically or mentally uh, after seeing a number of doctors, I began to look into the thing to see if uh, anything like this had ever happened before. And I uncovered this incident that took place in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, where something crashed about 60 miles from what was then the most secure Air Force base in the world, because it was the only place in the world where there were atomic bombs able to be delivered to, a, to, a, to, an, to an enemy country. Uh, the Russians didn't have them yet. Uh, the, the, the man who, who found the debris, Major Jesse Marcel, in an, some interviews which were, to me, electrifying, they took place between 1979 and 1982, admitted that this debris was of unknown origin, and he described it very carefully, both on television and in a book called The Roswell Incident. What was it like? Well, he described uh, bits of, of wood that were like balsa wood, but which could not be burned or broken and could not even be, they, they bent like, like plastic that had uh, hieroglyphics on them uh, that could not be read, uh, sort of in a violet color. He described metal that was as thin as he described it as the foil inside a cigarette package, but so strong you, they couldn't even put a bullet through it. Uh, in fact, uh, t t in taking this description to a metallurgist recently, uh, I found that we still can't fabricate anything that, that fits the description of this material. Okay, how do you relate that to something extraterrestrial, though? Well, I really don't, necessarily. What, what Major Marcel said was, and what I say about my own experience is, that it is unknown. And what I would like to get across is the fact that something quite extraordinary and very unknown is happening. Or whether, even whether what happened to me is related to what crashed in New Mexico is, is not known. I, for example, before I wrote Communion, and. Uh, in, shall I, I think it would be uh, kind to say invalidated myself to a degree. At least politicians don't ask me for contributions anymore. Uh, uh, I had a lot of friends in, in politics and I went to a couple of, a, a senator and to a congressman who are in the respective armed services committees and said to them, please, just privately tell me, is there anything in this? And what they said to me was this, that the government had looked into the so-called alien abductions and couldn't figure out what it was all about any more than I can. Uh, however, week before last, after I wrote Majestic was published in the States, it's dedicated to Major Marcel. I come from a family with lots of Air Force in the background. And a number of Air Force people who have had something to do with this have come forward in the past few weeks, especially this gentleman, uh, Richard Doty who is a, a, a count, was a counterintelligence officer until uh, last year. And he told me in an interview just uh, the early part of last week, for the first time publicly for attribution, he said, yes, it happened, something in Roswell. Uh, he said, but be, when we had a certain amount of, of awareness of this, but it was classified at the time because they didn't know what the origin of it was. 
But uh, besides this material, were there any little alien corpses found? Well, uh, Doty says there were, were but I haven't uh, gotten... It just seems so fantastic to me. I find it very difficult to believe, frankly. Although I, he I, is a, I find it very difficult yeah, to believe. Yeah, especially how could it be covered up for so many years? And why would they want to cover it up? What's the point in covering well, it up? If we are being threatened by aliens, as in war yeah, of the worlds and so on, surely we should all know about it. What if, what if this happened? 1947, the United States and the Soviet Union were at each other's throats. Suddenly, this strange debris was found. At first, uh, it, uh, there was a press release about it that went out, in fact, was even published in the London Times, to the effect that the Air Force had found a crashed flying saucer. Uh, then the next day, this was all changed. It was changed because they couldn't allow anyone to know that something unknown could be get that close to that base. And why it stayed classified all of these years is a good question. And I think it's a question that's being asked in the government right now. And I suspect that the reason I was contacted by Doty, which it's not an official contact, but it's fairly close to one, is that maybe that's sort of a trial balloon to see what happens if they begin to let out the idea that this did occur. Hmm. Why do you think that aliens would have gone to you, for example? Uh, I am an utter skeptic about such things. Why did they go and to they, me? They didn't drop in on well, me. Well, see, bear in mind, I don't know what happened to me. We don't even know if it's related. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. This happened in 47. There have been UFO stories in the papers and uh, radio TV for years. Uh, I had never been very interested in them until, except when I was a child. But you hear things and see things without even necessarily registering it. No one knows what, a, what the effect of a radio uh, news story that you don't really listen to actually has on somebody. Maybe these stories are something that has a sort of unconscious response to this possibility that we don't uh, yet understand how it comes about in a human mind. Mm. Or maybe they're really out there. Your book is a mixture of uh, fact, the Roswell incident, yeah. and fiction, because there's a narrative uh, right. throughout. Yeah. The aliens that you describe in the book are not exactly endearing creatures, and yet, no. yet um, you want us to understand them. And the descriptions of the aliens you write about would make us fear them. Embryo abductions, for well, instance. Well, what I experienced was extremely frightening. And if this is real, and it begins, it spreads, uh, we get 50 letters a day. Th that's the remarkable thing. When I, after I wrote Communion, uh, I didn't expect to, I, I mean, I hoped I would get a successful book out of it, of course, but I didn't expect what happened, which is that ever since it was written, we have been getting between 30 and 50 letters a day, and that's four and a half years ago. Mm. There uh, would be the suspicion, though, that um, Americans used to have the commies to kick around. That's my fear. Right. That now that the they don't have gone, commies they, to kick around anymore, so they have aliens. The govern government's going to, going to admit that this is happening and say they're terribly evil and we better go ahead and build Star Wars. I hope that's not what's happening, I, I, but I fear that might be what's happening. Your own experience, uh, where you were abducted temporarily to a spaceship yes. and you were well, prodded... Well, to a little room. I okay. didn't see any spaceship. I still haven't ever seen one. Okay, so we don't know where it was, but no. you were abducted by these strange right. creatures. Some of my neighbors saw it. I mean, apparently. I think I would have gone around the twist after I an experience. I almost did. If I hadn't had a... My doctor has a, been a friend for, for 20 years and has a wonderful sense of humor, thank God. And... Uh, when I went to him with this story, uh, I hadn't occurred to me that it had, uh, the alien l l outlook hadn't really crossed my mind. And I told him to describe these little people. He leaned back in his chair and said, you're telling me you were taking them on a flying saucer so by little men. And I said, that's what it sounds like. And he said, I think it's a really great psychosis. <laughs> <laughs> and that helped, I mean, because I began to laugh about it a little bit. And did it occur to you that this was just the deep reaches of your own imagination? That's what I thought it was, of course. But what about this feeling of discomfort when you woke up the following morning after having this experience? <laughs> it was very disturbing and confusing. And there was also a lot of pain in the side of my head where they'd put a needle into my head. Then I had a brain scan, and there's a mark in my, inside my brain at the point where the needle went in. So uh, what are you to make of a thing like that? Well, we all know that in voodoo cultures, if you tell someone they're going to burn, and you just draw an ordinary mm. finger down an arm, a burn will... Here. Maybe it's something like that.